announcement, and I'm going to be preaching about being prepared. Um, Because if any of you haven't realized yet, uh, it's Christmas time. And it seems that every year, Christmas comes earlier and earlier. The rush is on. Uh, We begin to prepare sometimes before Thanksgiving, even. But in this church, in the church, it's, it's Advent season. Uh, And this is a time that we prepare for the coming of our Lord, for for the coming of Christ into the world. But how do we prepare? Well, on the extreme, we see almost every year these videos of these people who are going absolutely crazy on Black Fridays, trampling others, and and some people even die. And I'm so so, uh, amazed because... They're doing this, are they doing this to give gifts to others? You know, it's, it, it just boggles my mind that this even happens. But that's on the extreme, that's not us. But we prepare kind of in this same way, we buy gifts, we get the tree ready, we get prepared for the holiday season. We put up the lights, and I always, I couldn't help but play this clip, because I always think of this clip when we talk about putting up lights for Christmas, because my family loves this movie. So let's, let's watch this. You want to hurry this up, Clark? I'm freezing my baguettes off. 250 strands of light, 100 individual bulbs per strand for a grand total of 25,000 imported Italian twinkle lights. Hey! 25,000. Well, I hope nobody I know drives by and sees me standing in the yard staring at the house in my pajamas. If they know your dad, they won't think anything of it. Oh. Fire it up, Dad! I dedicate this house to the Griswold family Christmas. Oh. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Oh, oh, uh. Twenty-five thousand lights, and not a single one comes on. All this preparation, and if you've ever seen this movie, everybody goes inside disappointed, and Clark stays outside, and he's trying to figure out what went wrong, and he checks all the lights, and he says, you know, I only have 300 left, Uh, and it turns out that it was just a switch in the garage that was left off, and so there's this funny scene where somebody's going into the garage to get a pie or something, and they're just turning on the light for uh, the garage, and then the house brilliantly comes on into the night, uh, and then as they leave the garage to turn off the light, the house goes off. And so Clark is getting so excited, he thought he fixed it, and and the house comes on, and then it goes off, and he's disappointed, and he doesn't understand, uh, and he can't figure out what keeps the lights on. He had done all this preparation for Christmas, but he's left trying to figure out where the power comes from. And I think we can be like that. Uh, We can prepare for Christmas in all these different ways, but we can still be confused about where our power comes from, what it's all about. Because Christmas, we all know, it's more than lights, it's more than trees, it's about the coming of our Savior. It's, it's about how we, we wait for his coming. And sometimes we can get lost on how to prepare. So how do we prepare for the coming of our God? There's this scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, it speaks about preparation. To set the scene, Moses has, has brought the people out of Israel, out of Egypt, out of slavery, and they're bringing them to the promised land and they're traveling through the desert. And they enter this desert, Sinai. And they come to this Mount Sinai where Moses goes up and he speaks to God. And God tells Moses this on how to prepare the people to come to the mountain. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. 
have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. And then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. And on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. They stood at the foot of the mountain. These people had an experience that none of us today could even imagine. They watched as Moses had come before Pharaoh and had demanded the freedom for their people. They watched as he performed miracle after miracle. They walked through a parted sea. When they were hungry, God fed them with manna from heaven. When bread wasn't enough, he sent, he sent meat from the skies. When they thirsted, out of the rock poured the water, but they come to this mountain and they could only stand at the foot. That, that's, it's kind of strange. I mean, God had been with them from the beginning. God had watched over them all this time and then they can't go up the mountain? And should they touch it, they would be killed? And they could only even approach the mountain once Moses had prepared them by washing their clothes and consecrating them. They were to be clean and consecrated before they could even approach the mountain. And consecrating had something to do with, with being set apart for God, being something that was holy to God. It could be done by using oil or even sometimes blood. But what it meant was that these people had to be set apart as holy. And even when they were clean, even when they were set apart, they could only come to the foot of the mountain. Although they had been prepared, they could not go up the mountain. Because there was a separation between the people and God. There was a gap. They were separated out as holy, but there was still something wrong. And I don't, I don't think that we have to think very long to figure out what was wrong. We've read the stories. And even if we didn't have the stories, I have my own heart. They were separated by sin. They were separated by evil. The evil we know in our own hearts. Because God warns them that if they come up, His anger may break out against them. And who could withstand the anger of God? And we can understand this because we know God is good and truly just. And these people had rebelled against Him over and over again. They had turned from everything they had been created for. And so they were separated or else risk death or else risk destruction. But that wasn't God's desire. God didn't want His people to remain separated. He didn't want them only to come to the foot. We know God didn't want this. They were His people. And God would not let sin have the final victory. He wouldn't let the story end there because He would prepare us Himself. He'd prepare us by bringing a Savior. One who could clean us and consecrate us in a way that we would never again need to be separated. One who could find the way between good and evil. One who could wash us of our sins and set us apart as holy forever. That we no longer need to stay at the foot, but that we might actually climb the mountain. And so there arose this promise of a Messiah, of the one who would bridge this gap. We wouldn't need any mediator because God, God Himself would be our mediator. God would serve as the mediator. And so there was this plan but it wasn't a new plan. God had been setting this up from the beginning as is the way of God because He knew that we would turn away. 
So He would come and He would prepare us. He would come and make us clean. And we see this plan throughout time, chapter after chapter, verse after verse in the Old Testament, tell this story coming to life of who that Savior would be before Jesus Christ was ever born. Since even before Moses, when God told Abraham that all the nations would be blessed through his offspring, we knew that one would come. When he stayed Abraham's hand from sacrificing his son Isaac, and it was said that on that mountain of the Lord, the sacrifice would be provided, we knew that one would come. We knew that one would come from the promise that another prophet like Moses would arise. We knew that one would come. From promising that King David would never cease to have the son on the throne, that this king, this savior would come lowly, riding on a donkey. He would be a mediator and a light to the nations. He would bear our sicknesses and our sins. His followers would leave him. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. They would abuse him and he would go willingly. He would not defend himself, but submit himself to death. He would be pierced. He would be pierced in his hands and his feet. And we would look on the one whom we have pierced. They would cast lots for his clothes, give him gall for food and vinegar to drink, and he would die with the wicked and be buried with the rich. But death would not hold him. God had planned for this moment from the beginning that His Son would come down and give His life for the sins of the world. And His Son would wash us. And His Son would consecrate us. We know this from the Scriptures. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through Him. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulders, and His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Preparation. Preparation. And in that moment of salvation, the moment of all of our redemption, God was washing our clothes and consecrating our hearts and preparing us that we might not only come to the foot, but that we might climb up it. Because you see, when Jesus Christ was crucified and died, the Scripture tells us that the moment He gave His Spirit up, the curtain of the temple had been torn in two. And while that might not mean much to us, the curtain was the thing that separated God from people. It was the thing that separated the most holy place where only the high priest, the mediator between us and God, would be able to go. And only one day, only one day, on the Day of Atonement, when the sacrifice would be brought for the sins of all of Israel, It was the curtain that separated man from God. It was the foot of the mountain, and it had been torn in two. The curtain had been torn never to be replaced. It's as it says in Hebrews, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have forgiven, Sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The same themes over and over again.
You see, while Moses consecrated the Israelites and washed their clothes with water, Christ came and washed our clothes in His blood and consecrated us with the Holy Spirit that no longer do we need to be separated from God. No longer is there a gap to be bridged. We have come to the mountain and now we can climb. We have been prepared by our God. But too often, that is where it ends for all of us. We come to the mountain of God we stand at the foot and we never even seek to climb. We stand at the foot of the mountain with permission to go up and we stay back. There's this testimony that I heard from a missionary. She was born in Africa and she lived in this village and, and they didn't have any electricity. All they had were these little small flames in their houses. And so mostly they just lived in darkness until one day electricity came to the village but what they never realized once the lights were on is that in the darkness, you couldn't see how dirty the houses were. But in the light, all the places of dirt and filth were visible. She said they had two choices. They could either turn the light off or they could keep the light on and clean the house. And she said, I chose to clean the house and I have never gone back. And so we have those two choices. Do we turn the light off and live in darkness? Or do we clean our houses? Do we go up the mountain? Or do we stay at the foot? But this raises that question. How do we do it? How do we climb the mountain? How do we prepare? We prepare the way Christ told us when He said, don't worry so much. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or how you will be clothed because life, life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. We can do it by not being afraid because God our Father was pleased to give all of us the kingdom. We can do it by sowing generously, but, but not because of guilt, but by being a cheerful giver, having a cheerful heart. We can do it by selling our possessions and giving to the poor. We can do it by being obedient. By being ready to do whatever is good when it comes before us. By slandering nobody. By being considerate and gentle towards everybody. Because you know what? Once we were foolish. Once we were disobedient and deceived and enslaved to all kinds of passions. We lived in malice and envy. We hated and were hated. But Christ saved us. Not because of our goodness, but by His mercy. He saved us by washing our clothes and consecrating us, giving us rebirth through the Holy Spirit. He brought us to the foot of the mountain and He told us, you're to climb. And we've been given passage and allowed to go. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Because He didn't prepare us to sit idly by and wait. He didn't prepare us to wait at the foot. He prepared us to climb the mountain, to clean the house, to prepare ourselves for His return. That's what Advent is about. It's about preparation. It's about how God has prepared us and how we must prepare for His coming. We've been given new clothes. That's what Christ said. We've been given new clothes ready for service. And Christ calls us to be prepared like servants waiting for their Master to return from a wedding banquet so that when He comes and knocks, we can immediately open up the door for Him. And he says, and it would be good for the master to find us waiting when he comes to the door because he'll come inside and he will dress himself to serve. And he'll tell us to recline at the table. And he will wait on us. That is our God. That's how we're to prepare for the coming of our Lord. We prepare by following our Father. By following Christ, we accept the clothes we have been given and we act accordingly. We turn on the lights. We clean the house for the Master will be home 
soon. But so often we don't prepare in this way. We can string up the lights. We can put up the tree. We can wrap the presents. But we forget to open the door for him. So often we can celebrate and we keep the master outside. We forget that we're not just celebrating a day that comes every year. We're not just celebrating a season. We are preparing for the return of our God, our master. And that requires something of us. In fact, it requires everything of us because we are changed by it. It redefines us. No longer are we here to serve ourselves. We're here to serve the Master. No longer do we seek after pleasure, power, and greed because we know the Master has prepared us for something so much greater. And we wait for that day in great anticipation, but not sitting idly. We clean the house. We climb the mountain to reach the summit and meet God. And we have been prepared for a life like this because of our Savior. That is what Advent is about. It's about the anticipation of the birth of our Savior and the anticipation of His return. And if ever there is a time to get ready, it is right now, it is today. But we can't prepare like the world does. We don't turn on and off those lights confused of where our power comes from. We keep the lights on, we pick up a broom, and we clean up the house. And we are joyous because when the Master comes, we will all be ready. We will all be ready. And when He comes, we are joyous because the mountain is no longer closed to us. And we are joyous because in Isaiah it says this, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. Let us go up. Will you all pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank You for this season and this time, Father. But may it not just be a season and a day for us. May it be a time, Lord, that we might be changed and that we might start to climb and that we might clean our houses and our lives for You. For we want to be ready for you, God. And you sent us your spirit so that we might be ready. We pray, Lord, that you might be with us in our lives going forward and that we might seek to honor you in all our days. In your most blessed name, we pray. Amen. Our God is with us. And as Josh was saying, we have a choice. We can rejoice in it or we can let it pass us by. But I know I want to go up to that mountain and I want to be joyous. And I want to rejoice for the, for the Lord God has come. And so we stand and sing these words, ushering in the spirit of our God. Yes. 
disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadow puts you fly rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to Amen. Mm-hmm.